Um, there has been a lot of benefits which has been achieved by the women. For instance, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, the number of women who are entering in the corporate world uh, is, of course, it is rising, um, though at a very stable pace. But there are certain kind of gender stereotypes which still prevails at the workplace. There is very sexism which still prevails uh, at the workplace, though the nature and the expression of sexism it, it has become, uh, it has uh, changed the nature of the sexism, has changed the expression of uh, sexism, has been changed. Uh, for instance, if you look at the uh, statistics, uh, if you look at the statistics, or if you examine the corporate uh, pipeline, you will see that there is a huge gender disparity that exists uh, at the level, at the entry level, and also if you look at the C short uh, uh, representation of women also. So uh, now, those partners are willing to take more and more uh, number of women uh, uh, in different kind of profiles, but uh, if you th uh, thoroughly examine the kind of profile that offering to the women, it is slightly uh, different. There is always a big uh, restriction. Uh, the profiles have always been limited. For instance, HR is something which has been regarded as this is a domain of the women and so very few men have opted for HR kind of profile. But if you look at the finance, the strategy, if you look at the marketing, men are always given the preference. So, uh, though the women are entering into the workforce, the number is rising, uh, the inequality starts at the very first promotion. They have been taken into their roles, but the promotion is always been restricted. So what the corporates are doing to address this challenge? Are they really doing enough to provide equal opportunities to the open? Uh, to discuss this, we have with us uh, the, a few representatives from the corporate, also from the uh, trade unions, who are doing, doing very well, who are doing very successful in their uh, career uh, in uh, uh, respective fields. So we have with us Ms. Anjali Pedekar. Uh, Anjali has worked in the State Bank of India and she was active in the union in SBI for more than 10 years. She was the first woman to hold the position of president in the union and the only member in, uh, of the All India State Bank of India Staff Federation uh, Central Executive Committee. Now Anjali is working as coordinator for India for UNI Global Union Federation. Uh, welcome Anjali to this panel. Uh, we have Ms. Aparna Astana. Aparna uh, is currently the Chief Manager of Planning and Chief General Manager, Planning and Economic Studies uh, in Indian Oil Corporation Limited for the Mumbai. Then uh, we have Ms. Renuka, my extreme yet. Uh, Renuka is the Deputy General Manager Human Resources. Uh, she specialized in performance management, that is her current portfolio at Hindustan Petroleum Corporation of India Limited. Then we have with us Elise George, who is a senior executive in Bharat Petroleum Corporation of India Limited. So, uh, the flow of the discussion will be slightly different from whatever we have witnessed so far in the previous sessions. Uh, there will be no PPT, no presentation over here. It will be completely to open for discussion. So I'll just shoot a few questions to the panelists and uh, I'll just moderate the discussion. So we'll start with Anjali. Anjali, you have to uh, tell us uh, you have worked, you have been a very successful traditional leader and you have been very successful in leading your own organization in the last so many years and you are a successful, you had a successful career uh, in the State Bank of India also. So what is your uh, experience uh, being a traditional leader and also being an employee of State Bank uh, of India? What kind of challenges? As a person you have, as a woman you have experienced 
and for your witness to uh, her, the other women in the uh, in the statement they have. So you have to be very context specific. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sashmita, and let me first thank uh, Dr. Vibhuti and Dr. Uh, Nandita for inviting me. It is an honor. I, I am an alumni of uh, Blue Course here in DISS, and it is always a great pleasure for me to be here. So, uh, uh, Sashmita has asked me about my experience. Actually, I had prepared some other things which I wanted to say, but okay, never mind. I will stick to my experience as a public sector bank in State Bank of India. The experience is not very bad because the pay, uh, the pay gap, which is normally discussed about globally, it is not there because we are public sector, so women and men are paid equally. Then when we joined bank in 70s, there was a huge talk, there was a position, ours was the, one of the first large intake of women, and it was thought that uh, oh, the bank is going to be doomed because there will not be, women will not be opting for promotions, there will not be enough men to carry on the burden of uh, uh, this uh, running the bank and what are these women going to do? They will go on maternity leave, all these girls get married, oh, this bank is going to be doomed. But as it happened that the women did opt for promotions, they did not bother about being reallocated, transferred to different places, and they took up challenge and today right from the uh, branch manager or branch level, counter level to the chairperson of a bank in public sector and private sector, the women have been handling their careers successfully. So that is as far as uh, the banking goes. Uh, all my colleagues here on the panel are from the corporate world. In the, that is in the sense they are from the management side. I am the only one who is from the trade union. So let me say, that in trade union, unfortunately, there are no women at the decision making level. My work has been done very easy by Dr. Paul's presentation earlier today, who has gone into details how many women are there, why they are not there, and how they should be brought into the decision making in the trade union. So in trade union, actually, uh, for me, I feel that the trade union treats the women members as second class citizens at best and at worst as a headache. They, they take their subscription fees, they put them in front in more chars to get good media coverage, but the women's issues are always on the back bench. They are never discussed. So just let me be very brief and tell you that trade unions don't have any budget allocated for mainstreaming of women. They don't have any uh, planning or strategies to get women in the mainstream trade unions to hold decision making responsibilities. In corporate, there are mentoring relationships. The management consciously develops the women leadership today, particularly diversity is being talked about and all, almost all the corporates are giving uh, serious thought to inculcating more women in the management cadres. But this is not happening in any trade union. My trade union has been one of the best trade unions it is really good, I am very proud that I belong there, but my instance has been, you know, uh, a sporadic, you know, I mean, it is uh, just a chance that our general secretary at that time happened to feel that the women should be given encouragement, in his time he gave encouragement, after that it stopped. So this, uh, this is a chance, this should not happen. In the banking industry, women have been working for more than 60 years. And today, uh, Dr. Paul said that 37.5% women uh, belong to the trade union, but in uh, particularly in banking industry and particularly in urban areas, the women workers uh, sometimes are more than 80% or 90%. So under such circumstances, representation is extremely important and one of the uh, pillar of uh, decent work is that representative voice should be heard. So we can't allow men only to represent ourselves, we also need to represent ourselves. And this is where we are lacking. This is my experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasmita Ji, and thank you the organizers for putting this particular session in this conference, which I felt uh, is 
uh, very, very important because we are talking about women in paid and unpaid sector and probably sometimes, you know, if we, the girls who have made it, they are there already and some, some of them have really reached the highest of the echelons. So we keep talking about uh, Madam Noe or Madam Chanda Kocher who have really been, and banking sector in particular where a lot of women are at the CEO positions. But that's not the start or end of the corporate world. Corporate world goes across the industries. And I have spent about 37 years in this uh, sector starting way back in 1981. I've gone through all the uh, areas where I've been a location in charge, looking after a complete state, logistics, and uh, state called uh, Himachal Pradesh, which has all the logistic pressures. And when I was posted, then my the then chairman had asked my uh, GMHRD, uh, and Mr. Tubeda was the person, many of you may be knowing him, uh, because he was a uh, person known to the energy industry. He said, uh, Subir, are you very sure you are posting a woman there? Uh, and I worked there as a field officer, and it's a very difficult terrain to handle. So he said, no, I know the girl that I am posting. So that was the kind of thing, and that gives actually the thing that uh, there have been challenges, but believe me, Sasmita, uh, I always felt that why are they asking me? I mean, I am just doing the normal average work assigned. And why every time they are asking, you are comfortable? You are okay? Because I was the first field officer to go in Indian oil in 1983 as a field officer in LVG. And I was, those were the days. And now are the days. We have plant managers as our uh, women are plant managers, they are terminal managers, they are handling automated uh, terminals on their own and you know now they pick and choose, and just choose a girl and send to a difficult location. Once she is there, things will be very well taken care of. So there are challenges but there are a lot of laurels also and a lot of memories down the lane when you are really tackling and doing it. And you somehow sometimes become a role model for others too. Having said so, it's really not so easy also because I, in my personal experience, have seen it. You are accepted because people have very low expectation because of their stereotype by thinking women can't do it. And when you do even average, they think, oh, oh my gosh, she did it. So you get the positive side of it. Now you go up, then you oh my gosh, yeah, I to look at that. <laughs> so as the progression starts, so the pyramid starts narrowing, then the issue starts. Where I personally feel, like we all know in 2014, the norm was promulgated that one woman officer has to be, the woman director has to be there on the board. Uh, for all those organizations which are listed. And you can see the statistics is a uh, evidence in between. Like in 2010, from barely 6%, which were also mostly family directors, now the figure is at 14% in just straight 7 years. The growth has happened. But somewhere we have forgotten what is happening to the growth which is happening in the progression from the entry level to the c suite level. What exactly is happening? Is somebody watching that? Is there any mandate on that? That's where my concern is. I was just looking at certain things and I was very shocked to see that the employment number in general has gone down. And that's an issue of concern. And there are issues. And those issues I can really relate when I look at various experiences that that we share from women when we meet in different forums in our training programs and things. And I personally feel that we really want to see women really growing. We really recognize them. The studies show that whenever a woman director has come in position or as a CEO position, the profitability numbers in the post next two years have gone up. These are the evidences from the studies which are available, you can see. Not that the men are not, but I personally feel the women are disposed, engineered genetically differently to be multitaskers. The way they approach an issue or the way a man approaches an issue is different, we have seen. 
So you find a difficult employee working for you very happily because of your basic womanly instinct because you will approach him very differently. There are strengths and management today needs to identify those strengths rather than looking at those difficult. The difficulty is that that decision making level the women are missing. And unless that, that's why I very strongly feel that unless government promulgates certain laws for the corporate sector as well to see that, that there is another law which says uh, a woman has to be there on the recruitment time. Now how that is getting implemented is important. Whether a woman is there from any level or from a level where she will call the shots for the, during recruitment. That's important. So implementation, how the laws are there? There is a law that uh, every uh, com listed company is by saying that you have to declare your home and employment data. Even as PSUs, I am very surprised that uh, several companies are still not declaring the data. So the gender uh, auditing which should happen is missing. So these are the things which I think if, if there are laws, these things can be handled very nicely. There are laws, there are certain things which are beyond laws which are at the very psychological level where I feel management has a bigger role to play. <coughs> now, we all are grown with our own value systems in life. And how do you break that thinking that women are not only for their first duty is home. And all women are not like that. You need to give them an opportunity to prove themselves and then make an opinion that yes, she is not. It's like men and women. Some men are multitaskers and very good performance, same as with women also. So breaking those biases for those, especially for those men who are at the decision making level, who will make the difference in the progression of the woman up right from the entry level to the C suit is very, very important. Where we really need to have a lot of training interventions or some psychological. We have handled some of the to break these things. And then there is another issue with a lot of women coming in, the numbers have grown, there are a lot of women coming in. I'm looking at my own this thing that on the technical side, the lack of women entering. On the not technical side, not technical side, I'm saying CS, MSWs, or MDAs. The numbers are higher. So if we are at about 9% uh, total in officer batteries, then 40% actually is from the, if you look at the marketing line, there will be 40% non technical and the technical vis a vis other, it's lesser. So those are the kind of things. Then I feel at the personal level also, probably, women, if they want to really find their place, they want to curve their niche, it is really required that. They have to break their own things. When you are entering, when you are getting an opportunity, after getting into the organization, a lot depends on you that how you would traverse through the thing. Uh, there will be things that you will be able to manage very um, comfy jobs for you. But is that really going to help you or the masses thereof, thereafter? You also. That's an issue. So, I personally feel women today when we are talking about in corporate level, we are really, there is a great need to have a tripartite kind of a handling of the issue at the government level, at the management level and at the personal level. And there are several issues we can talk as we move ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would like to send you a script. Yes. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the four. And normally from the corporate, we are always armed with PPTs and Excel sheets whenever we talk. And this is a stereotype which is broken right here. That is, yesterday we have been watching PPTs and the other ones were actually talking without PPTs today. Yeah. So uh, basically, like uh, I joined HPCL about 20, 21 years back, and uh, uh, the journey of 21 years, if, if I can capitulate in few words, is like uh, uh, you know the journey that we have seen of HR actually moving from uh, predominantly being uh, IR centric 
to an uh, organizational development or HR centric kind of uh, role. So like uh, we were also talking about that HR actually has changed gender from a he to a she. So most of the uh, people actually today who is joining HR are uh, women. I also, I mean actually when we are talking about um, uh, most of the things which my IOC colleague has talked about, is we share a similar kind of a background. So um, uh, basically, um, so in HR uh, the roles that I have handled are, uh, gen are the generic uh, verticals of HR. But uh, as we say that, uh, you know, if you want to really grow up in an organization, you need to take up challenges. So you need to look for opportunities where you will be able to prove yourself because all said and done you need to prove yourself doubly harder to be to survive and progress in a corporate environment. Like Aparna said, she got an opportunity to head a region and a zone uh, in, in Himachal Pradesh kind of an organization. But uh, in, in my context, we didn't have that kind of opportunity to go into the field. But an opportunity came when ERP uh, was being implemented and one of the largest ERP uh, implementation in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, I, uh, at that point in time, I took up that challenge and uh, was one of the only female in 100, uh, team of 100 uh, men. Uh, uh, the kind of challenges that I faced at that point in time, I would say is the character that has, it has given to, uh, you know, the, to my personality. The kind of exposure that it brought to me about how the organization functions, where organization makes money from, is not what was taught in my MBA. It's actually what I experienced. And in that, uh, uh, the whole phase of the ERP uh, implementation, when I uh, went to travels across the, uh, the country, visiting many locations, many kinds of people, many kinds of experiences, actually is the foundation of my professional experience, I would, I would say. And uh, the challenges of being the only woman was also definitely there. Uh, but I would say that we still belong to an organization where uh, when we joined it was 5% of women in our organization. Today uh, we have reached 11.5% in last uh, 20 years. Uh, this is because of the focused interest that the management had on increasing the uh, gender ratios, on increasing the numbers uh, which were there. And uh, to do that there are multiple interventions which later on we will talk about which has happened and which has helped us progress in the, in the organization. So if we talk about uh, uh, that, uh, probably many of you would, would uh, be aware of that uh, we were one of the organizations and the first one in oil and gas industry to have a woman uh, CNMD and uh, director marketing on board and that has definitely definitely um, given us a lot of uh, you know inspiration and impetus to the interventions we, which we wanted to do in HPCL to uh, you know strengthen the women community in, in the management and person. So many of our interventions are basically motivated that we don't want to rest on the glory that we had one in the CNMD. We, we may have multiple and we have the capacity to produce multiple CEOs in our organization. Yes. We share similar kind of industry backgrounds as IOC as well as HBC. So I will not go much into the industry background, but let me talk a little about my own personal journey in BPCL and uh, some things which we can take away from this in terms of what we need to do. I joined way back 30 years back in the organization. And at that point of time, I, we were four out of uh, four women who were chosen out of 150 in the southern region we joined. I remember my interview very, very clearly. It was in Hotel Ashoka, Bangalore. And uh, when I went for the interview, I mean, I came through a written test and interview route. We had two rounds of interviews. And after the first round of interview, I came out and there was a senior lady executive um, who had joined at a big management level and uh, she had come to handle the recruitment process. And she came out and told me, Ellis, you need to go and fight. So I went in and I said, I said, give me a chance to prove myself and I will be a good officer here. And all through my journey, I have found women supporting me and mentoring me very informally. And that is one of the big things which I 
I, and I can remember each one of them and I narrate that as I go along. The second very um, thing which really stays in my memory is I joined and I was, uh, uh, we have, we are basically into a uh, major chunk of our job is marketing and we have the backbone as operations which Abhanya was handling and all that. So I went and reported to a marketing setup. And I was a very young officer. I had my boss who was almost on the verge of retirement, post 55. And he had kept my portfolio very clearly ready for me. And he said, you would get an area, I was in Bangalore those days, and uh, you would get a sales area which is 40 kilometers the radius of Bangalore, traveling around for you. And in those days, you can imagine small roads, we never had highways. And he says, the first target which I give you is I'm going to keep the sales area for you. You need to buy a car and learn to drive in the next three months. If you don't do that, you don't get it. So we have any bosses who really believe in you, who support you. The environment makes a lot of difference. I had to handle areas where I had to go meet direct customers. You know, these are big, big, huge industries where you go meet the general manager of the industry, try to sell you know, thousands of kilometers of product to him. And the, I remember the first time when I walk in, they said, oh, there's a young lady. And I had my own inhibitions at that point of time. They didn't really take me seriously. I mean, they were all keys at those times. So I used to wear a sari very consciously, just to look a little mature and, you know, I'd be taken very seriously about it. So opportunities make a person. We need to grab those opportunities as women if we want to succeed. Opportunities will not come knocking at our door. Another thing I have learned in my journey is we need to get our priorities right. Can we be successful as a career woman? Can we be successful at, work, at home? But we define our own successes. Who defines our successes? We define what is success for us. So I have had opportunities that I uh, was provided an opportunity to become a coach for the organization which meant I had to move and uh, do a training for six days. My daughter was very young. And I had another lady mentor who kept pushing me and it's going to do it. It's going to be the best for your career. At different points of life, different points of our career, we get different opportunities knocking. If we take a call, we let it go, it's gone forever. At that point of time, what is the choice we make? Do, can we find some support system which will help us manage our work? What I mean, our personal life, so that we can focus on career. If you think this time we are going to only focus on our other priorities, and then it's too late to you know catch up on your career at that point. I became a coach, and almost five, six years in the recent past, I have done uh, been a coach for the organization, which which had huge amount of traveling. I would be home only by the time my daughter's grown up and gone. Uh, flown the nest, I would be traveling about six days a week and I'd be home only for the weekends. And people kept asking me, how do you manage? I said, this is what I want. We must clarity, have clarity on what we want. If we have clarity on what we want, if we find that work is fulfilling, for me personally, it helped, I knew it would help me to grow as an individual and it would help the organization. If we have that clarity, we would be able to push what we want. It was tiresome. Traveling, you're standing about, we used to start working at 9 in the morning, this is a facilitation. We used to go on to 12, 1 o'clock at night. We would still do it and be up next day morning and then travel back the weekend at home and go. Have the clarity and when women have the clarity on what they want, get their priorities right, it helps them to move ahead. Now having narrated my own story, is it applicable to everybody in the organization as I have seen it over the last 30 years? No. We have, uh, we, we, got, we became an organization in Paratatu Le Vartar sometime in 76, which is about 42 years. We have women in the organization from the early 80s who are in very senior levels now. But if you look like what we do as 70, in terms of percentages of women which have grown, it is not much. The role, the industry we are in, is it is difficult. We, it, we, do, we have very few back end jobs as such which women get in. Women have to be in the forefront, which means rain or sunshine, a woman has to stand and fill an aircraft on time. There is no let up on the time. One of the criteria for a woman to be on the tarmac and do a fueling job is she must have an HVD license, which is a heavy vehicle license. Are women willing to do that? Yes. Women are willing to do that and stand on the tarmac. We have our locations which are. Uh, operating location which are 40-50 kilometers outside the city. 
If the shift starts at 6 in the morning, gets over at 2 in the afternoon, they need to be leaving home at 4 in the morning. There's a pickup break. We make sure all the safety aspects, you know, they're not the last one to be dropped, etc. But the moment women, what we find is women want the best of both worlds. And when women want the best of both worlds, it is an issue. I want a softer job, I want my progression. That will not happen. We need that kind of clarity. Women, so it becomes a problem. When we look at promotions, when we look at transfers, when we look at postings, these kind of things come. And it's just a small section of women who need to change, you know, make a negative perception in the minds of men about it. Because, you know, it is, it is the acceptability of women when we, you know, when we have prom promotions, transfers. It's just a discussion which also happens about the person's performance, the attitude of the person. So even just a small section of women, you know, people will go, oh, they're not willing to go there, they're not going to, you know, go to the new location. So therefore, we as women need to do a lot. Yes, the perceptions of men also need to change. And in society, I mean, we can't, uh, men cannot have different perceptions in the organization and different perception of women in the society because it's all the individual love together. So, if we want to change more, make, bring more acceptability of women to do jobs in, you know, and higher jobs, higher responsibility, different kind of responsibility, new challenges, we need to carve the way ourselves so that the perception of men also change in society. So, this is just a few of my thoughts about women in the organization. Asking is something which is very common, very much prevalent in the organizations. Uh, but if you are raising the ceiling for the woman, you have to raise the floor also. So you have, whether you, your organization have any kind of policies that try to uh, raise the floor for the women, that try to give equal opportunities to the women, any policy level or because in recent years, you will see that a lot of legal provisions which have come in, like your matter to benefit amendment at the cost, everything is in place. But in addition to that, uh, what are the other policy level changes you have brought in? Uh, I just connected to my reply uh, earlier. So what we have done is like the focus right now uh, in our organization is not only to improve the gender ratio, but also to make sure that uh, the leadership pipeline is actually fair. So uh, basically, um, uh, this is a general thing in the corporate sectors where we talked about that we, there are a few um, women in the leadership and uh, it is more so and more evident in, in the PSUs. So percentage of women are actually uh, less than 2% in the leadership in, in PSUs, less than 2%. So that's a very alarming thing. Of course, there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, it is also because, uh, for example, we are into a refining and, uh, refining and uh, marketing uh, industry. And uh, as Aparna said, if you need to go out in the industry to be, say, the CNMD of the uh, organization, you need to have uh, the marketing or refinery background. And most of the jobs uh, in, in our industry, like even if I said it is 11.5% of women, the 60% uh, of the roles that are being held are in the corporate sector. Corporate jobs in the sense finance, corporate planning, uh, HR, information systems, uh, audit, okay. So all those legal, all those kind of roles, uh, there are plenty, plenty of women and they are doing extremely well for themselves. But when you go to the, the refining and marketing sectors, we don't have as many numbers of uh, women. So uh, there are uh, uh, concerted efforts to make uh, the, the, the percentage increasing in those areas. Uh, one of them is like we are coming up with model uh, locations. There are locations uh, uh, which are completely operated by women. The entire region is being uh, operated by women from uh, all kinds of roles. And uh, you might have definitely seen uh, uh, all the three companies have uh, our retail locations, our uh, uh, face, face of our organizations which are operated by women. You might have seen, you can see it in Bombay, where all the women are operating the uh, refilling stations as well. 
there are uh, terminals which are our supply locations which is being operated by women and basically this is uh, to prove two points one that women can do all kinds of jobs and that will instill more faith in in the minds of the people who are placing the women and other women also that they will be able to do these kinds of jobs uh, and it also helps us to make all the locations ready to uh, absorb more women basically in the sense that uh, recently we also heard about you know the leading uh, engineering institutions increasing additional seats for engineering students okay girl girl students okay so when these uh, engineering students are actually coming on for the, for the job it is one of the best opportunities for us to who because we are the uh, you know mostly we uh, engage uh, engineers so if our locations are ready to uh, take on those engineers uh, uh, readiness when i say uh, it means not only about infrastructure about facilities about safety but also about the mindsets of the people because uh, i would again uh, refer back to ellis and aparna and their experiences because the women who are posted in these kind of locations are locations are all far flung and outside the cities because we are in in uh, Uh, product we handle products which are inflammable and need the same operation so they are always out of the cities so you have to travel to those locations at odd hours and uh, the mindsets of the uh, of the people there in the sense that uh, they have to deal with operators technicians uh, drivers truck drivers so all kind of things are there so we need to have all those kind of you know awareness built in so that women can uh, go there comfortably and uh, safely work on those uh, in those locations we also have a focused capability building and leadership development programs specifically designed for women and uh, of course all of us have uh, different types of uh, leaves and time offs to uh, cater to the needs of the primary caregiver role of uh, women so uh, one more thing i want to add on this is that uh, diversity has also been one of the focus areas in the entire oil oil and gas industry and uh, recently there was a, a center of excellence which has been uh, built in uh, with members of the industry to look into this area i just want to add uh, something to what she is already saying one is that we uh, as women like sorry uh you know like uh, uh why it's very important to offer yourself for opportunities and look for scope for and be ready to grab it uh know your priorities how they they are i think there is a lot of still desire to be happening at uh, the mandatory statutes which are required to help grow women's number not at the entry level only how they progress because at the moment the thing starts narrowing then the heart starts beating harder and harder and out of sight out of mind and those who go out to prove themselves in the field sometimes they find totally sidelined when it comes to go up and the one who is not gone out of the uh, ac offices to prove themselves they have been inside and closer to heart and they so that's the kind of feeling those who go and try hard that also happens but that can only be taken care of when you have certain systems in place to take care of the things b young girls have started coming in i i start i joined the organization in 83 and we were hardly any numbers and i was the first one the field officer and we were three of us were recruited the next year two more recruited and three out of these six gone thanks to the marriages and the parental parent in laws pressures to be a domesticated daughter in law so 6 mein se 3 hi baje so that kind of thing and i am very sure now that i had location i see a lot of women those pressures are not gone down much they are still there and they are still there because there are issues so what did you talk about the security part of it yes that remains an issue and when i am talking about it i have talked and i have this is who are working the corporate sectors if we are talking about corporate sectors it's really really important that there are laws to security now the girls today they are coming from fashion institutes they are coming from uh, 
um, different institutes are going to the corporate world, it's private sector. And the things are happening <coughs> till 11 o'clock. The meeting starts at 7 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And you are on your own where you reach your home. Now the parents of unmarried women or even the, with a married woman or a woman with a smaller child. But I keep listening to the stories that how a lady had to leave her job because her boss constantly ensured that her husband ke baadhi ghar paayegi and she is leaving the child with her mother at Ghatkopar. She has, uh, she has started staying at Ghatkopar, leaving the daughter uh, with the Meera Road because she cannot go after 10, 11 o'clock to Meera Road every day and reporting 9 o'clock. Those kind of issues are there. In our oil industry also, I have seen that, I have heard these stories, when a girl, lady is in the seventh month onward, pregnancy time, the location charges are not sensitive to the needs. They may be back home. So where is the intervention to ensure? So there, a lot of uh, gender sensitization is really required. In the last four or five years, I mean, I, um, as a, my role as a WIPS coordinator within the organization, I keep looking at beyond my regular job, which is there as part of the dissemination, at these kind of things which are happening. And and anybody in time, we're very, very uh, clear that if there is a proven instance of misconduct, the location in charge really is put under state of suspension. If there is a sexual harassment case kind of a thing, very strict actions are taken. So that, having said, there are also cases when the concocted cases are also there. So the committee is really under a lot of pressure. In fact, I would like to say this thing here is, is a forum of women and young girls here. Be very wary of using the mandates and things if you are using it, misusing it. Never misuse it. And if you are a private that somebody is misusing, please raise your voice. Because you never know a uh, misconduct at, on my part may actually diffuse the chances for several others, even for entry into the corporate world. Activity at the working level is very, very important because this then it plays a very important role when the time of APS comes. When they sit down to decide whether worker A or worker B, because girls do have a dual responsibility of societal role and the family responsibility and the career. They keep doing the things and in that they will never be having finding time to do special networking or over and above networking beyond the office hours. And when it comes to choose, you know, all corporate sectors you have 25% OS and then another 40% in VG. So when the line has to be drawn, many times it's the woman who face the brunt because they are not that near, because they have not been networking. So these are the things where I personally feel the management has to have a way which I feel is a very, very an area which is still lacking to improve upon, I don't know, the exact answers to or strategies to handle this HR, HR aspect, which I personally feel that is really holding back women from reaching the top and while my mandate directors have gone 14 percent and still if you see the titles below, they are still nowhere at 14 percent. So women's presence in C-suite is also not directly helping increasing the real numbers with which we are actually uh, worried of. So maybe uh, things like if uh, there is a governmental uh, mandate that the organizations have to give the numbers of percentage of promotions happen and the trainings that have been exposed for external uh, trainings, whenever it comes for a foreign component training, you will find the percentage is good match. So those are the kind of interventions which are really, really required. At our level, we, we recently learned, uh, three, four years back, that the women, when they are going on maternity leave, so, you know, after a fixed number of years, you fall due for a next promotion. And suddenly, it came to our notice that a girl, suppose if she was, uh, three, uh, the minimum period of stay in a grade is three years or four years, and if she is gone into metro, uh, no, maternity period, 
in the third year, the two years that she spent get dissolved. And then she comes back on those three and a half years that she has put in the services work and her cycle starts so thereby she will pick up a grade after eight years. So when this was pointed out, but I would say yes, management was supportive, it was much going on, nobody so please be whosoever, wherever, wherever you are when you see, sometimes it's not deliberate or by design also. Because these policies which are guiding the thing, these were drawn by the organization at a time when they were not having good. In fact, we have a very uh, story which we most joke about that once big new building was getting to be operated, it was got delayed by a month because just before inauguration they realized there is not a ladies toilet provided <laughs> at the executive floor. So those are the kind of things because it is not there. So it's very very important for inclusiveness of women at the decision making levels of whatever other kinds. Recently we got another uh, policy that all locations have to have <coughs> toilets for all women whether contract or whether uh, on roles and for both kinds because the young girls when they go into their things and uh, don't expect that they will be using the Indian toilets. So European and Indian both have to be there. So these are the very, very small things but it's a, it's, when it comes to that one particular woman she will never have the voice you can ask for it because then it becomes an issue. It's not an issue. Recently we came across another thing was talked about that uh, suddenly in a particular department about 50% women, I mean there were only 8, 4 went into maternity period <laughs> and they were stuck with it. They said, what to do? They are going. I said, but this is a case where we can always think of work from home. Medicals are not open yet for work from home. So these are the things which are really required as interventions at the management level to improve, to help, to have certain uh, policy supported issues. I went for an HPA and I realized that I cannot, I am a single mother. I have never married and I adopted a daughter, seven months of age. So I know being a single mother, handling how or how, it's not difficult at all. Once you do things properly. There are People who are ready to help you out in your issues. Uh, when I went as a location in charge, I, my job required me to travel at least 12 days, 12 working days in a month, uh, definitely in the state, 12 to 15 days. And where would I leave my daughter? I went to the Jesus and Mary school in Shimla and I talked to the sister superior there. She said, why not? One maid will always be there for your daughter. And I, whenever I used to go for tour, I used to drop my daughter in the dormitory. And then I used to come back, I used to collect three days later from the day. So that was a support system. But who? Not my management created for it. It was my need, I went, I tried for it. And it was there. Sometimes we don't even speak of our needs, we don't try to find out. So be very open. <coughs> Fire all cylinders that's available to you. Go for it. There are people who support you. There are a lot of people who support you. So, Finding your things and finding a reply always for your needs from the management is also not an answer. But identify your need rightly because we all in corporate world get employed for <coughs> bringing up the profitability of the organization. The bottom line is the profitability. So we have to be very, very sensitive to this one issue that what I am really bringing on the board. Okay, just for the time we need to close. So just until we one kind of advice for the next generation uh, for my leadership in training. Yeah? Just one liner. Okay, actually you have given a lot of time to the corporate side, management <laughs> side. <laughs> Not enough to go training yeah. So I registered my protest here. <laughs> the good training I need to register my protest in that. Okay, uh, I just before, before I know the time constraint and of course the people who are providing a lunch, they also have their lunch hours, so we need to, I mean working hours, so we need to respect that. Uh, before I give one line answer uh, or experience or something, 
I just want to say that uh, uh, what we are, your next question which was written in your email was that what your organization is doing to get better uh, gender balance. And as a Uni Global Trade Union Federation, ours, I am working for Uni Global uh, Union Federation. We have a 40 for 40 agenda in which all our affiliates have agreed that they will have at least 40% of each gender in their all their decision making bodies. And we are consciously working towards it. We are lagging behind in this in our Asian region. But still, there is a marked pro progress. And how we do it? We don't do it simply uh, for the sake of making the balance, appoint some ladies on a decision making committees. We would like uh, capacity building and leadership development uh, to happen in real sense. So we do help hold program for promising women uh, recommended by their unions and uh, equip them to take up the better responsibility. We don't want somebody suddenly uh, to be made a vice president of uh, women and then not being able to handle the... Uh, sitting in the trade union office is a very difficult thing. It is a male word still. So uh, you won't see many uh, uh, women sitting in trade union offices in the mixed membership trade unions. So when I became a president of my union, my constitution had to be sent to the labor department for amendment because all the duties of president were listed as he will do this, he will do that. So to make it gender neutral, my union has been in existence at that time for more than 25 years and it had to be made gender neutral. So things like having a ladies toilet which I congratulate uh, Ms. Astana on for as a management leader she has Propose this. This is very important. This is very important issue for the women workers. So things like that that can happen only through trade unions for the workers. They need to come together. Collective voice needs to be raised. So respect the collectivism. That is what I would say. And uh, the trade union images are not really very good in our country at least. But trade unions are doing good work, and we need to. If they are not good, we need to change them. We need them to get up and uh, give more attention to the women membership and the women members to come forward to take up decision making positions. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> uh, first is my um, advice or my suggestion to the uh, young leaders. Young leaders is uh, uh, please nurture uh, these five traits. First, is be an intellectual firepower in whatever area you are working. Be very passionate about what you want to do. Uh, have values like uh, integrity and empathy for the people whom you work with. Critical thinking, it is a... Everybody else responsible for your decisions. Sometimes you may have to maneuver a way to get your decisions accepted. But once, even if you have followed your parents or your bosses, you have taken their life, it's your decision. So own it. Once you start owning your decisions, you'll be a happy person. Thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of the time, we are not able to take off any question uh, on this session. So we will conclude here. And uh, we invite all of you to interact with the panelists in case you have any concern in your mind which you would like to address. Thank you very much. And if you just come to us uh, an urban place, where you have no identity, where you have you have lost your entitlement, and you become you come here to become a customer rather. Like you know, when you come to uh, in a city, is you you come here to become a customer, and the better the customer you are, better citizenship rights you have. I mean, if you if you as long as you are in your place where you have spent all your life and where you have been born. That kind of a social thing gives you a kind of an identity, it assures your social collateral, it assures you your rights, it assures you your entitlement. But here after coming, I think you just remain a customer and how then city deals with you. How, how everything in the city and that's what we are going to explore today. Uh, that how women and city and uh, informalities are... Uh, towards only redundant, making you a redundant citizen and uh, I, we, we just see nothing more than that.
anyway, to we'll deliberate on this for the next one hour. And I have very eminent speakers with uh, with me. We, are, we have four speakers: Shalini Sinha, Shweta Tambe, Archita Khatter, and Kirak Moge. I will introduce my panelists uh, right now, and then we'll go one by one. Is that okay? And each panelist will get about uh, 12 minutes to speak. Uh, 10 minutes, I won't commit. Last two minutes, I will just do like this. And I, I request to, because because on one more thing I've seen in the, uh, yesterday also and today in some sessions that we really we could not, there was no space for question and answer. So we should, whatever we have not been able to address from this side, we'll get provoked in the question and answer session and we'll take this ahead. So Shalini Sinha is going to be the first speaker today. She is currently the India country representative from Vigo. Her work focuses on developing and documenting recent work and livelihood opportunities for women workers in the informal economy, especially home-based workers. Prior to Vigo, she worked as an independent consultant specializing in labor, gender and social development, uses for uh, national and international NGOs and funding agency. Second speaker of the day is Anchita Ghatak, sitting uh, left to me. She is women's rights activist and development professional. She began her work as an independent consultant on development issues. She funded, uh, she, found, she founded an organization called Parishita uh, with two other activists to work for the rights of women domestic workers. She has also set up Kolkata initiatives to make life better for elderly women and adolescent girls from underprivileged communities. So welcome, Manchita. Our third speaker is going to be my very dear Shweta Tambe. Shweta is an activist from Mumbai working on the issues of housing and livelihood of dispossessed community. She heads the Habitat and Livelihood Welfare Association and is engaged with providing skill training and setting up enterprises for women for uh, women from minority communities. Now the la I'll just talk about the last speaker who is very very dear to me, Kiran Moghe. She is a member of Central of Indian Trade Union, C2. She is also a member of IDWA and also IAWS very eminent speaker. She has been engaged with organizing Anganwadi and domestic workers in Maharashtra. So we will, we will hear Kiran Mogi in the end. First we will begin with Shalini. So 10 minutes for you. 12 minutes for you. Yeah. This is a small presentation. Whatever I think you can see from there, a small presentation. Uh, so, in the last session, uh, we spoke about <coughs> glass ceilings. I think in this session, we are going to talk about sticky floors. Floors that are so sticky that they keep the women workers at the bottom and never or very rarely allowing them to go up the pyramid. So, I am going to talk about women in common workers in the cities. My name is Shalini Sinha and I am part of this organization called VIGO. It's an acronym for Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. <coughs> Established in 1997 with the objective of improving status of the working poor, especially women in the informal economy, through systemic change by increasing their voice, visibility and validity. <coughs> Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but just to let you know that we are an international network and we have three constituencies, organizations of informal workers, researchers, statisticians, and thirdly, the development professionals. Uh, we also have a, a well-developed uh, uh, website, www.mego.org, where many of our research and documents are placed, and several of them are on India and across the world also. <coughs> Uh, as I said, we are international. This is a slightly dated one, but we are an international network that presence in several countries and members and active partners from many countries of the world, particularly uh, the South. So we've been talking about urban informal uh, workforce. 
and we've been talking about the casual workers, we've been talking about the different sectors, the categories of uh, informal workers, home-based workers, construction workers, etc. Uh, we've also been talking about self-employed, we've been talking about wage workers, so we've, we've been cutting the uh, informal aid in different ways. One of the ways of cutting it is also when you cut it by the place of work. So it is in the very definition of work, traditional definition of work, a worker is somebody who works in a factory or an office, has a formal relationship, a formal a contract and has some protection. Informal sector is just the reverse of it. And one of the uh, issues is that the place of factory can be a factory, uh, a place of work can be a factory or an office, but mostly it is not. The place of work is also informal. So what do we mean by this place of work? Let us just quickly glance through it and see what it is. Informal workers can be on streets or in open spaces. This is particularly in the context of cities. So they can be in uh, streets or in open spaces. We see them every day, the barber, the vendor, the roadside uh, barber and the construction workers. <coughs> they can be in hotel, restaurants, offices, as contract workers or even as wage workers, cleaners, janitors, dishwashers, helpers. In small workshops or karkhanas, metal recyclers, shoemakers, weavers, garment makers, we see them all the time in the slums. In unregulated flat factories, slightly bigger factories, and they don't uh, function, many of these don't function in isolation. There's a connection with the formal sector, there is a uh, connection um, uh, with, the, uh, with the informal sector also, but also with the formal sector. So it's not in isolation that these places are existing and work is going on. So in unregulated factories, and the two most important places are home, home as a place of work. But those who work in their own home as home-based workers, whether they are garment makers, embroiderers, it is across sectors, uh, shoemakers, artisans, electronic parts, assemblers. There are some who also work in homes, but not in their own home, but in somebody else's home. So home as a place of work is also an important definition for some sectors of informal workers in the cities. <coughs> In Vigo, we work with four sectors, home-based workers, street vendors, waste pickers, and domestic workers. <coughs> uh, just, a, uh, just some few key broad points about informality, and, uh, uh, and this is not just relevant to India, but in most developing countries. First is informality and poverty. While there is no complete overlap, there is a large number of large overlap between informality and poverty. Most informal workers are poor and most working poor are in the informal sector in cities. <clears throat> and because they are in the informal sector, at the low end of the informal sector, earnings are low, there is no uh, social protection, no protection from or very little protection from the labor laws and the costs and the risks of working in the informal sector are borne by them and often are very high. Informality and gender, higher percentage of women workers than men workers are informally employed. But they may be more informal workers than women informal workers, but within women workers, a higher percentage are in the informal sector. And they are concentrated, even within the informal sector, are concentrated in lowest earning segments of informal employment in all regions. In India, we will see later on. <coughs> The third is informal economy and cities. So if you take the prism of cities and then look at the workers, you will see that in the cities a large number of workers in uh, the global south are in the urban workforce, urban, uh, informal enterprises, informal um, um, workers. And the cities, despite this, when we, cities as they modernize, as this whole push for cities and urban habitat happens, these workers are the ones who are not just marginalized, who are not just um, penalized, but they, their livelihoods are destroyed. So in my presentation today, I will try to show the livelihood of informal workers, particularly women workers, from the prism 
of the urban issues. So while we have gender, while we have labor, there is another prism that I'm adding, which is the lens of cities. <clears throat> Again, this is more general. Um, if you look at the informal economy, this is what I said, sticky floors. Uh, if you look at the segmentation by sex, you will see that and the unpaid family workers, industrial outworkers, home workers, these are largely women. Correspondingly, if you look at average earnings, you will see that it is at this bottom that the earnings are also low and the risks are high. So women at the bottom of the pyramid, where the earnings are low, the risks are high. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that urbanization is a reality for us in many parts of the world. And uh, it's uh, in India and other places also. Uh, we are predominantly urban or urbanizing at a very rapid pace. The global commitments to reduce poverty and inequality, the SDGs and other agendas, all of them will succeed or fail in the cities now, it looks like. And in order for them to succeed, cities must strengthen their economies, create jobs and also enhance existing livelihoods. And they cannot do it if they do not take the majority of the livelihoods which is in the informal sector. So in, as we talk about modernizing cities, as we talk about smart cities, as we talk about <laughs> cities of the world, we have to talk about not just protecting informal livelihood but also promoting informal livelihood. <clears throat> Look at Indian statistics, nothing surprising here, most of us know it. But this is from NSS 2011-12, and we have done an analysis and looked at sectorally um, uh, also. And this paper is a paper by Chen and Ravindran, which is available on our website. And it shows that a uh, large number of workers are um, informal, and for women it is marginally more than men. <clears throat> but what is interesting is what it shows is that home-based workers uh, our large number, as compared to men, are home-based workers. And if you combine home-based work, street vendors and waste pickers, the most vulnerable, the most uh, exploited against sectors in the cities, then they are more than one-third uh, of the workers. <coughs> uh, there is a gender dimension, we've been talking about it, we showed you in the last a slide also, I'm not going to go into detail of this, but just a couple of things that I want to say, that the percentage of men informal workers who were employees was far more than women. There were hardly any um, women who were employed. But the percentage of men who were domestic workers was far less than women. So <clears throat> there, within the sector, sectors also, there is a gender disaggregation. Again, these statistics are available on our website. We also have statistics city-wide from six cities uh, on informality and those themselves are very telling documents of the extent of inf informality in some of our cities in India. So if you look at the women informal workers, they have multiple identities. They are workers and they are employed in informal employment. They may be members of a particular group defined by class, race, ethnicity or caste. They are residents of slums or squatter settlements, which has its own um, um, you know, conditions and it has its own challenges. And then there are women within their households with you know, limited amount of agency, with um, many care responsibilities. And all of them come together to form the informal women workers in the cities that we are talking about. So, uh, so just to say that women informal workers <coughs> have different identities and different constraints. Some constraints are common with all informal workers. So all domestic workers have similar kind of constraints street vendors would have. Some are um, common to informal workers. So all informal workers don't have or they have very little social protection, lack of legal rights. And some are uh, gender related constraints which is, you know, gender gap in education, skills, property rights, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to 
um, because we I have panelists talking about uh, different sectors. But I do, do want to say that we have to look at livelihood and augmentation of livelihood uh, along with the city practices because the way the city develops can destroy your livelihood. It can also add or take away from your earnings. So home-based worker, when she has to pay an extra amount for electricity, cuts into her. When the water flows into her house because of poor housing and she cannot work for a few days, clients or the, uh, cannot come to her to give her orders, the, the, her housing, home as a place of work and housing, has a direct impact not just on habitat but also on livelihood. Similarly, street vendors, public, the whole concept of public space. What is the public space for? Is it for livelihood? Who owns it? Who can use it? And how will the city be designed with public spaces? I think these are very important issues. And even sometimes when street vendors is the flavor of the nation <laughs> currently, get some uh, space, uh, women and their needs, you know, security, toilets, uh, UTI is a common occupational health hazard of women's street vendors because they don't have a place to go to the toilet. So <clears throat> we have to design cities which factor in livelihood options of, waste, uh, of informal sector workers. Waste because similarly, I'm not going to go into detail. <clears throat> so just um, to say that when we are talking about cities and urban livelihood, not only do we need a gender lens, we also need a holistic understanding of informal employment and how they can be included and enhanced in our urban renewal programs. So urban renewal programs cannot be designed without taking into account informal livelihood or livelihood of large number of people who are living in cities. And <clears throat> but not to say that cities cannot be generators of urban employment, they can be generators of urban employment provided our programs of skills, local economic development are targeted at the informal sector, particularly within women. And our, the development, the, the mantra to urban livelihood should be that informal sector needs to be embraced rather than destroyed. And uh, inclusionary approaches have to be designed where large industries can coexist with smaller industries, where housing projects are looked at places of habitat as well as places of work, where roads are seen as places of wind as well as places to walk. It's not as if it is one or the other. It can be both and we need to have an approach to urban development which looks factors in these informal uh, employments. <coughs> have uh, uh, come up to, uh, uh, discussions that have been going on for some time because uh, they have found their place in uh, academic discourse, they have found their place in social action. Uh, yesterday when uh, Shumita was talking about uh, domestic workers, Professor Shumita Chen, she pointed out how uh, domestic workers are still invisible in the po uh, policy space and how it is difficult to uh, even uh, say how many women domestic workers there are in India. And she said that estimates differ from 2 million to 90 million. And uh, looking at um, uh, our space in Calcutta, one of the things that um, strike us when we work with domestic workers and in, in our work in discussion with domestic workers is what are the, you know, we talk of domestic workers' rights and uh, their rights in the workplace. And uh, today I would like to talk to you about how the city views domestic workers and, the no and how domestic workers' mobility is that uh, hindered or enhanced by, by the city, the administration, the, the, the employers, and the city in general. In Kolkata, we have this uh, a phenomenon of large numbers of women who come into work to the city every day. They, they come from the nearby villages and they travel for hours. And uh, you know, and many of them leave home as early as 3 o'clock in the morning when it's dark. And at that time no transport is available for them. Uh, most of them work and they work in groups trying to um, 
come to the station from where they take trains to come into the city. And as we all know that uh, employers are, you know, they're also looking at their watches because their whole uh, day depends on the domestic worker coming in time. But, but what is the state doing to ensure that these uh, women can get to work in time? Uh, sadly, nothing. And, and this is a daily struggle. Uh, a few days ago, I was at a book release in, in Kolkata. And the name of the book was The Boy Who Loved Trains. And uh, uh, people there were all talking of their memory of railway journeys and uh, what, and you know, and it was all very nostalgic and people were talking of fun times. And uh, there was a domestic worker who was there in the audience and, and she was asked to say something about her journey. And she said, oh, I do this every day and it's, it's very, very difficult. I can't tell you how hard it is. And that's the story. I mean, the women come in the morning. Most of them walk in groups because it's dark and they want to be safe. And then once they get on the train, it's, it's not comfortable. Early morning, it's, it is crowded, but not as crowded as it gets when they come back. But in, in the train, they are looked upon with suspicion by everybody and mainly by the agents of the state. Uh, the, the GRP looks at them as people who are ticketless travelers and, and at the slightest, you know, they are subject to various kinds of not just interrogation but assault. And most of the time this is just normalized because, uh, you know, domestic workers really hardly if ever raise their voice against this because as we know, for many women in India, street harassment is common and, and domestic workers have somehow normalized this thing that you know, the police will get after us and this is the kind of accusation that we will have to face. And the train stations too, a few years ago we had done safety audits of some train stations. Uh, to see how conducive they were to uh, women who use them. And, um, and there we found that uh, there were hardly any places for women to wait, women or anybody, but since we were talking to women domestic workers, and all of them talked about how they wait in the afternoon to um, uh, go back home. And uh, the wait is very uncomfortable because it's in... Uh, you know, in the, in the sun or in the rain, there are hardly, if any, sheds available. And uh, some amount of advocacy with railway authorities uh, helped and we were able to get uh, sheds uh, done in a few stations. And uh, what, what comes across through this long journey of women always is the, is the lack of public toilets. I mean, this is something that is... Uh, becomes especially difficult for domestic workers because many a time, even in their workplaces, they are not allowed to use toilets in their employers' homes. And neither the state nor their employers seem to think that this is required. And in today's discussions, um, we've, we've been talking about how, uh, you know, women can't do this. The, the attitude that many women professionals face. But in, as far as domestic workers are concerned, I think the, it seems as though the city is indifferent about, about making working conditions suitable for women domestic workers. And it is like they can do anything and everything. And no facilities need to be provided for them. And uh, neither the state nor employers seem to take on any kind of responsibility for making, um, you know, enabling, to, uh, creating enabling conditions for domestic workers. The other big issue that uh, faces domestic workers in their, uh, uh, in their everyday life is the whole issue of childcare. This is again an issue that is, that used to be uh, discussed in the women's movement, but over the last uh, decade or so, there's been very little discussion on the issue of childcare. 
and women domestic workers come to look after other people's children, but uh, very little um, discussion on how their children will be looked after and what will happen. So this, uh, the consequence of this is that uh, um, children drop out of school, especially girls, and then there is a whole, uh, uh, there's a very strong anxiety about what will happen to girls and can they continue their education. So they again fall into this uh, trap of, uh, you know, being poorly educated, hardly having any training, and not being able to uh, look for better opportunities as far as employment is concerned. And uh, the other, you know, this is the whole uh, process of uh, mobility and getting to work is where uh, uh, domestic workers are unprotected and feel extremely vulnerable. Uh, the uh, other thing that is happening in the cities, and, and because uh, uh, this is seen as poor people's travel, traveling every day by the local train, and uh, very little attention is paid to uh, make facilities better. And a very worrying situation is developing uh, now where uh, when domestic workers are uh, coming into the city because the way people live is also changing. Earlier there were independent houses, then that was replaced by multi-story buildings, and now we have the gated communities. And the gated communities are becoming very exclusionary enclaves, and domestic workers again are, I mean, uh, being treated as second-class citizens, invisibilized, and even in places, you know, this is a workspace where rights are very limited. And we know that uh, where domestic workers in, in their employers' homes, they face uh, very uh, crude kinds of discrimination. And in, in Bengal, we really don't have the class discourse but as far as domestic workers are concerned, in their workplace, there are habits that are a consequence of uh, very deep-rooted casteist ideas. Like, it is considered absolutely okay not to, you know, to have separate cups and uh, plates for domestic workers to eat out of. They, they don't use the same uh, uh, cups and uh, plates that the employers use. And, and uh, the other thing that happens is they are not allowed to use toilets, as I uh, told you earlier. And what is happening in these gated communities is that there is a very uh, strong class distinction that is being made. And domestic workers are not being allowed to use lifts that the residents use. And, and uh, this also, I think, is, uh, I mean, this, this is something that is worrying all of us. And what is, the, what is this kind of city that is developing, where everyone is always saying that, you know, we need domestic workers to help us run our homes, but when it comes to giving them even the most basic respect or dignity, that is lacking. Thank you. Now, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak here about the little experience that I have organizing home-based workers in the city of Mumbai. I have been organizing home-based workers for the last uh, three years. Uh, whatever little I have to share, I might ruffle some feathers, uh, which is fine for a good discussion. And uh, so. I will, not, I will not get into the statistics of a huge number of workers, especially women workers, being into an unorganized sector. But what I want to emphasize here is the fact that there is an unorganized sector, and within that unorganized, unorganized sector, there is a smaller sector which services this unorganized sector workers. And these, there is a double layer of vulnerability to them. They are unorganized, and within that, they are further servicing the people who are already into a vulnerable category of workforce. So that is one. 
Now, uh, there have been attempts to organize the unorganized sector workers, and the most visible forms of organization can be seen with Anganwadi workers, with construction workers, with uh, um, with BD workers, with uh, uh, many more. I mean, the, the list is long, but we might have to understand that these are workers, with, with street vendors, workers. But these are all unorganized sector workers who are somewhere having some form of a connection with the formal uh, formal economy, as well as some form in which they have this connect. They were they are physically also visible, and they have been visibilized through entitlements and issues of entitlements and rights. However, there is a huge chunk of workers who are not visible, who primarily cater to the needs of this informal sector which has slowly started starting to get visibilized in many forms. Like there is a parallel industry of garments where a huge range of garments are produced which cater to only people who are working in the informal sector. Uh, I have been attempting to organize these people and it's a huge task and uh, um, as we all know that all this all this work is located in the slums. Slums are the sites of location of these livelihoods, which are which are under attack. Every minute we are talking about urbanization. Urbanization, as Shalini ji said, urbanization is taking over. Or, or, the, the, or rather the kind of imagination we have that we have only cities where people live and they work in separate spaces. But there is no imagination where uh, a workspace is covered, coupled with a living space, which is true in all the slums. All the slums, the spaces are so ingeniously designed that they take care of the uh, spaces of work as well as spaces of life, uh, uh, livelihood. Most of the home-based workers obviously then are under threat, and these threats have to be addressed. Very recently, uh, our uh, development plan of Mumbai have acknowledged the presence of these kinds of uh, occupations in the slum community. However, there is no reflection of the same in, in, or relief for that in, in the uh, development plan that has been announced. So, there is acknowledgement, yet we don't want to do anything. So, we have to move beyond that. We have to think about um, you know, having uh, spaces for livelihood, we have to ensure that these spaces are retained, we have to ensure that these spaces are not individualized, we have to ensure that these places are common places, and somehow we have to make sure that these local places are taken off the market dynamics that is there. Uh, I don't know what way, what is a way to achieve this, but there has to be a way to achieve it, which probably we can engage in well on at a later date. Um, so, my organize, uh, I mean, the, in my work that I have been organizing these people, uh, the issue of invisibilization is obviously there. There is no legal framework to address who these people are. Yet, at the same time, the women find, uh, uh, moreover, I mean, uh, with the beef ban, with GST, uh, with demonetization, uh, a layer of informal workers who were in that sense recognized and organized were wiped off. And many of these women workers, home-based workers, were dependent on these workers who were working in various industries. So they have absolutely no work. Many of these workers have been, uh, have gone into many more vulnerable forms of uh, employment where they are practically living from uh, hand to mouth. They, if they fall sick, they don't have anything else to depend on. Uh, so, so we have to address these issues um, with, with very focused attention. It cannot just be you know, a passing remark in saying that, okay, GST and demonetization have done bad, but the, the kind of bad that it has done, probably it was intended to do that bad and probably these workforce can now be utilized to create chaos in the society which is intended to with communalizing them using identity politics and things of this kind. So we have to be very, very wary of these kinds of um, ramifications of economic reforms that the Modi government is propagating.
I don't know whether I'm allowed to say <laughs> Then there is a question of, I mean, we always uh, get, uh, get ourselves divided in the discourse of having citizenship rights and having organizing people uh, as citizens and organizing people as uh, workers. But, but mind you, if everybody is working in a slum, so they need their citizenship rights along with their workers' rights. So we have to find a way where we kind of amalgamate both of them together to have their citizenship rights as well as working rights. It cannot be exclusive to each other. I mean, um, so we have to think of new form of, forms of organization and we have to take them from there. Uh, I think I made all the points. Thank you. And um, many of the speakers have pointed out the invisibility of many of the informal sector women workers. I'd like to draw your attention to another set of workers who are fairly invisible otherwise, um, who are known as the scheme workers today. Uh, they're invisible in a different sense. Many of them are seen as government workers because they work in government programs. So whether it's the ICDS or the National uh, Rural Health Mission, now the National Health Mission, or the um, other different uh, government programs. For instance, there are teachers. Teachers working in something called the um, National Child Labor Amelioration Project or something like that. So uh, actually, I mean now, this is not only about cities, because when you think of all these workers, they are in both urban and rural areas. Uh, but there are something like, um, 50 lakh scheme workers in the country today, none of whom have any formal employment status despite the fact that they are working in government programs. And I'd like to draw your attention to particularly uh, three groups uh, because they are predominantly women workers. One is the Anganwadi workers and helpers who work in the ICDS program. The other is what are called the ASHA and also the USHA because they are now in urban areas. Uh, these are the health workers under the National Rural uh, Health Mission and the midday meal scheme workers. By the way, the midday meal scheme workers are paid only 1,000 rupees a month, even today. And the midday meal scheme program has been in existence for at least uh, 10 or more years now. Yeah. The ASHA workers are not paid anything. They are paid what is called an incentive. Which means that if they are able to persuade a family and a child to be immunized through for five years, you know, the whole immunization program, then they are paid an incentive per child. Or if they take someone to the rural health hospital because there is a, a campaign going on for uh, free reading glasses or something like that. So if they go through the health checkup, you know, it takes a period of almost two to three months. Then they are paid something like 250 rupees if that whole process is completed. So something called the Janani Suraksha Yojana, the maternity benefit scheme, they are paid an incentive if they are able to complete that whole, all the uh, conditionalities that are uh, mentioned in, uh, in, the, in getting the Janani uh, Suraksha Yojana. So the ASHA workers are not even being paid what the government would like to call an honorary. The Anganwadi workers have been paid an honorarium and have been paid an honorarium, but please know that they are called voluntary workers and they are paid an honorarium, though they work probably more than eight hours a day. Formally, they are working hours are from 10 to 3. So they work 5 hours formally, which is when they run the Anganwadi center, where they have preschool education and also they distribute the supplementary nutrition. After the Anganwadi Central timings are over, they are supposed to do what they call home visits. Plus, they are burdened with several kinds of other government responsibilities like doing surveys, um, you know, not just of their own children or, you know, in their survey, but also if there are epidemics they have to do, then they have to do immunization, they have to participate in the polio immunization program, etc. So the point I'm trying to make is, that the government of India today pays 3,000 rupees a month for five hours of work formally to Anganwadi workers and 1,500 rupees to their helpers. 
The state governments have additionally paid some amount. So I know that Maharashtra, for instance, after working for 30 years, the ICTS program started in 1975. After working for 30 years, an Anganwadi worker in Maharashtra is getting 7,200 rupees. So that's about 40 rupees a day, which is by no means any kind of minimum wage for the kind of work that they're doing. And it's on the basis of their work that the government says that we are going to meet our Millennium Development Goals of immunization of uh, maternal and infant mortality, etc. Et so, I mean, in a conference of uh, where we are discussing women's paid and unpaid work, I think we really have to take into account the kind of burdens that Anganwadi workers are facing today. I want to list out some of the activities that they're supposed to do apart from this kind of work that they're doing. For instance, with the Aadhaar scheme being implemented, they are expected to enroll each and every beneficiary in their survey into the Aadhaar scheme. So they are carrying little children between 0 and 6 years age to Aadhaar centers and spending days and weeks, you know, trying to get uh, Aadhaar cards for their beneficiaries or for the adolescent girls in their surveys or even the pregnant and lactating mothers. That's one of the activities that they have to do. They're not paid extra for that. They have to do what is called line listing of their beneficiaries, which means that they have to use a computer and enter the uh, height, weight, and the girth circumference of every beneficiary in their you know, Anganwadi every month. They don't have computers in their Anganwadi centers, obviously. Many of them are barely literate because some of them have been employed you know, much earlier when they were hardly 10 standard pass. So now many of them are going actually to some of these uh, centers in their uh, in the cities and spending their own money, their own honorarium on getting them like this line listing done. Because if the line listing is not given on time to the ministry, then their wages are not paid to them. So, you know, these, these are the kind of burdens that, you know, Anganwadi workers are facing and I think we need to take note of them because they also happen to be one of the biggest mobilizing forces on the streets today. But the government is also getting to them and as I mentioned yesterday also in our round table, in Maharashtra, last, uh, in May, if you will remember, when the Anganwadi workers were in a struggle mode, and they were struggling because the government had assured them of an increase in honorarium in 2017, which they hadn't been paid so far. The government of uh, Maharashtra decided to impose MESMA, which is the uh, Maharashtra Essential Services Maintenance Act, which in effect means one of the most draconian acts, which in effect means that you cannot go on strike, you cannot um, you know, stop working, because if you do so, you will be immediately suspended or your job will be. So it's despite this, and it's in fact it's because of their struggle that the government actually had to withdraw MESMA on them. But I think you know these are the challenges that they're facing. And the whole neoliberal economic framework in which we are operating at the moment means that there is increasing pressure to privatize this whole program. So in the name of CSR, many companies and corporates are now being asked to adopt Anganwadi centers, which in effect means that their wages will now be paid through the CSR funds of many of these corporates. And they are not going to be any higher than what they are being paid at the moment. In fact, the threat is that possibly due to this privatization process, any uh, sort of aspirations of Anganwadi or Asha workers or other workers in these government schemes to get some kind of regularized government work will probably be dashed. So that's one of the problems. The other is the general manner in which most of um, the welfare schemes in general, the budgets that are being slashed. <coughs> so their wages are not being paid on time. Supplementary nutrition has not been given on time. They are now being forced to adopt what is called take-home ration packets, which are actually just dried, dry uh, ration uh, in place of hot cooked meals the beneficiaries don't like it. Most of them don't eat it. As a result, the whole purpose of the supplementary nutrition program today is in danger. And then you will see a decline in um, nutrition, whatever. 
uh, and as a result, then the whole um, burden of that is again being on the Anglo-Bharati workers saying that they are not doing their work properly. The other major problem that they are facing because of budget cuts is that there are huge numbers of vacancies. So an Anganwadi centre has one worker and one helper. Very often the helper is not there or the worker is not there. So they are doing double duty. Sometimes they are managing two or three Anganwadi centres in the same area without getting any additional wages for that. So what I am trying to say is that the government through its own programme, with this perspective, that care, this whole, whole perspective about this care work that they are actually doing, that this is women's work on one hand. Secondly, it does not need, uh, you know, it, it is viewed as voluntary and ordinary. And in that framework, you know, women are actually being hugely exploited uh, through a proper government program by the government officials themselves. So I think we need to take note of this kind of informality which is there in the government sector itself. And I think it's increasing with more and more contractualization of many of the services that are being provided by government, particularly in the health and education sector. So I think uh, this is one of the areas that we need to take into account. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, at least Politiki has been asked this question many times. Do you, do you work with employers and what about responsibility? Well, initially we said we were working only with the domestic workers because the articulation of domestic workers' rights was important. And we felt that domestic workers anyway are always told about their responsibilities. <laughs> but uh, uh, the other question that has come up as we are in the, you know, we're trying to expand our work and, uh, I mean, you, you have to survive in this market and uh, um, so we are thinking of, uh, I mean, this is what we've started discussing with domestic workers that, uh, you know, they, they have to draw up norms uh, for themselves in the workplace. But, you know, every time this question of uh, leave comes up that domestic workers say that uh, they're going for two days, but they go for five. But the fact remains that they don't have any kind of... Uh, a regular leave. I mean, it, it's still very rare that uh, when domestic or at least in Calcutta, the, the, where I am uh, 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 talking from, it, it's still very rare that uh, when domestic workers negotiate working conditions, they say that, uh, you know, I, I want to one day off every week or I want four days off. I mean, this absolute minimum. And uh, that's not there. So uh, we always feel that uh, employers, uh, uh, rage or sense of disappointment in domestic workers not turning up when they said they will is rather disproportionate to uh, what, uh, uh, you know. And, and many of us actually as employers of domestic workers have had to take a long, hard look at ourselves and, and ask, you know, what, what you you know, as feminists, as women's rights activists, how, how, how do we uh, uh, treat uh, domestic workers or how do we behave with them? Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, is your question about uh, skills that are expected. Yes, I mean, this is another question as to, you know, uh, when people talk of training for domestic workers and, and will you do training uh, teaching them to use microwaves and washing machines. Our experience is that most domestic workers learn this very fast. I mean, if, even if they are unable to read, they, they manage to do it. And we also feel employers should at least take some trouble to train them. And uh, we feel that if, if we, uh, for that training for domestic workers should uh, focus more on things like collective bargaining, negotiation and literacy. We, we think literacy is very, very important. Not so much so that they become better domestic workers, but uh, that they become empowered citizens. And we do feel literacy is very important. And our organization is small. We haven't been able to run literacy classes for women, but we feel all poor women, all semi-literate, illiterate women should, should have uh, literacy classes. Sunita, your question, sorry, there were more questions. Uh, Sunita, your question about the adolescent girl and, you know, girls being unprotected, this is uh, very big, I mean, except that I am a little uncomfortable when you talk about pregnancies outside marriage, 
I mean, the, the uh, concern I think is uh, young girls getting pregnant, you know, before adulthood, etc. And uh, uh, we're I, and I'm not sure whether they're always a consequence of abuse. It's uh, Lots of times young girls get pregnant because they are experimenting and they don't have the knowledge about their bodies and contraception that they should have. I, I, there are programs for adolescent girls. I mean, child care for very small children is an issue. Uh, children continue, girls continuing in school, girls and boys. I mean, despite the RT, I mean, not, not that many uh, kids are still in school where, where they should be. So uh, these are bigger issues and they have to be looked at and, and knowledge about one's own body and uh, autonomy of one's own body is very, very important. I, I would just respond to the point about uh, professionalizing organization by saying that if you expect professional service, you have to pay professional wages. So, I mean, you know, domestic workers are so badly paid that most of them are working 12 and 14 hours to, you know, just make the bare minimum. So they are highly overworked and do not get any kind of rest. They do not get a weekly off, they do not get annual leave, nothing. So, I mean, I would say that we would be completely justified in taking four days off instead of two uh, if they are so badly paid and, you know, so overworked. So I think if you expect professional service, then you have to be professional in the, uh, at the whole level. You know, it cannot be only from one side. And I think most employers, when it comes to a demand for better services, do not look at this guy. They expect efficiency, but you really can't expect efficiency from somebody who is malnourished. That's my point. Uh, coming to uh, the young and valley workers, the point about whether there has been any legal um, redressal. Yes, the uh, the. Karnataka uh, Anganwadi workers had gone to court and there has been a court order that they should be paid minimum wages. Yeah. But because of this whole manner in which center, state and uh, labor laws are state laws, etc., uh, you know, there's a great disparity. So in fact, if you do see uh, Anganwadi workers in Maharashtra are one of the most worst paid, probably uh, workers in uh, Tripura, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka are paid better. So that's one thing. But even though there may be laws or there may be orders, I mean the Supreme Court has for instance ordered equal wages for equal work you know, in the Punjab case. But you can see that contract workers who are doing the same kind of work are not paid the same. So whether there can always be a legal way out, I'm not sure. It has to be also the government taking that political decision which it doesn't in this case. Uh, coming to the point about um, whether you know, privatization or the project for better nutrition. I mean, I don't know anything about Spiridina or whatever, but if it's a good thing, then it could be introduced into the ICDS as well. Why does it have to be a separate project? That's one thing. My point is that it's not these kind of, you know, sort of extra, what I, I would say, extra uh, services that are being provided through these kind of projects, but actual privatization of the existing Anganwadi structure, which we are concerned about. So, you're actually using corporate, I mean CSR funds in a way, substituting them for government funds. That's what's happening. So it's not that uh, the Anganwadi center is going to be any better. I mean it's not going to be the state of the art Anganwadi center which is being provided by through some CSR funds. It's just going to be the same, probably in the same rented accommodation. All that is happening is that the wages are going to be paid by through the CSR funds and whatever supplementary nutrition is going to be um, uh, paid for from those funds. So it's not that by through a privatization process or handing it over to NGOs or whatever, you are actually improving services. What you are doing is you are actually shirking your own responsibilities and handing them over to another sector in which, according to me, coming to Sujata's point, then maybe it's because it's the government sector that you are, you know, who is your employer, that you are in a sense emboldened and you have some hopes that at some stage you may be regularized and that is probably what is sustaining the struggle for such a long time. Uh, unlike in the private sector where the changes in labor law, the labor codes that are coming, etc. are actually now putting more and more pressure on workers so that they are feeling more and more vulnerable and not in a state to struggle. And if you have examples like what happened with Maruti in Haryana or whatever, then you know your um, resolve to struggle more is actually being uh, damped. Yeah.
and the state can't get away only by imposing these in, uh, informalities and these exploitative norms which has come in. So thank you very much. Questions. Our first speaker is Professor Christopher Vic uh, Victorin. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. Uh, she worked as a lecturer at Jalam University in Iran and at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi and various universities in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Very recently, she taught gender politics as guest professor at the University of Kassel and the University of Basel. As a researcher, journalist and author of books, her main interest has been to deconstruct the global, global economy as a gendered process with a perspective of feminist economics and feminist ecology. Uh, over to you. present my concept of care extractivism uh, to you and thank you very much to all of you who uh, for your patience to stay through this marathon. We have a really long day and uh, thanks for being with me. Very much of has, what has been said already here. Let me start uh, this uh, multiple crisis we are in, in social reproduction. I don't speak about the financial crisis. I'm saying societies, all societies are in, in a multiple crisis of social reproduction. And this leads to a reconfiguration of social reproduction on a national and a transnational level. Care extractivism I coined this concept analogous to resource extractivism because there was a lot of talk about resource extractivism after the financial crisis that many countries uh, tried to manage the crisis and pull themselves out of the crisis situation by extracting their natural resources. But at the same time, societies are as well extracting care and therefore I coined this concept which means firstly an intensification and an expansion of the commercialization of care work and secondly a strategy to fix the crisis uh, of social reproduction. The logic of care and provisioning gets undermined in the market by the principles of competition, efficiency, and profit making. So I don't have much to say about care work so, because it has all been said that it uh, is conceived as a natural female skill, more a skill, something natural, not work, it's just helping, and it is placed at a borderline or intersections from paid and unpaid, sorry, it's all a bit uh, messed up, uh, professional and un unskilled, low value, and there are many reasons in reality why it is, it gets low recognition and only very little paid. So, my first hypothesis is that strategies of care extractivism, and I focus now on Germany, it is my analysis, manage the crisis of social reproduction. And the crisis of social reproduction, which is very, very apparent in Germany nowadays, is a lack of caregivers for the elderly, and a lack of nurses in hospitals, and that is uh, slowing down now, but we had a very low birth rate. And the strategy against this, to manage this crisis, is first family, familiarization, privatization of care, meaning uh, pushing again more care work into the family, of course, unpaid. Second strategy is professionalization of care work, in, increase in efficiency. 
third strategy is in transnationalization, import of care workers, and fourth is the transnationalization of biological reproduction, the case of surrogates. So I will briefly different strategies of care activism. Professionalization in the health sector and for the elderly is taking place Tellerization of services and they are treated, treated like industrial labor. Care labor is treated like industrial labor, cut up in time units and permanently documented. So the problem this is from the perspective of caring is that there's no time for emotional or relational work, no time for human touch and empathy. So it is suggested that the wage labor includes all these emotions and this is unpaid work. It's included, but it leads to a systematic underpayment of the services for the elderly. David Harvey would call this a technical fix, fix through modernization, technical fix of the crisis, but it constructs the cheap care laborer and a tremendous pressure on the individual caregiver. Here these are uh, women, ambul ambulant uh, caregivers to the elderly who drive in small cars from one house to the next and there's a tremendous pressure on them. The second strategy is transnational care chains. And we have this in Western Europe now the most a uh, prevailing form for private households is to have a migrant care worker, mostly in Germany these are women from Poland and the Balkans, for 24 hours live in services. They cushion the austerity policies imposed for these economies and they cushion the adult worker model in middle class households where more and more women are now uh, professionals, working as professionals. The care extractivism leads to a new international division of care work along the axis, axis of class and caste, ethnicity, color, race, and north and south. Harvey would call this a spatial fix of the crisis. The transfer of the crisis from, for example, Germany, German households, to poorer, country, poorer countries, poorer households. It's a care drain which creates a shortage of care capacities in another case. Germany has a long history of transnational care extractivism. For example, 1963, there was a tremendous lack of nurses in hospitals. And so the German government made a recruitment track with South Korea under technical development aid and imported 10,000 highly qualified nurses from South Korea and additionally 6,000 young women from Kerala through Catholic networks which were called brown angels in our hospitals. When the South Koreans were uh, told they should go back in 1977 after there was no more a lack of uh, staff in hospitals, they said, we are not a commodity. We don't want to be treated as a commodity. So nowadays, the German state is once again normalizing care extractivism with the help of the German GIZ. They train caregivers for elderly in China, Vietnam, Tunisia, and many other countries in the global south, and import those people to Germany which makes, in, from a global perspective, for a transnational landscape of stratified reproduction, because this makes for a tremendous care drain from these countries where qualified people are, for example, in the health sector, are urgently needed. And uh, two scholars, Robert Van and uh, Markus Wissen, have called this mode of living at the cost of others an imperial mode of living by the global middle classes 
on the cost of uh, the global subaltern classes. My second hypothesis is the expansion of capitalist accumulation into non-market areas and into the body is taking place. And this is a spatial and a technical fix of the biological reproduction and the crisis of low birth rate or infertility. So I'm taking the biological reproduction under uh, the notion of care and care work. You know in India very well, uh, India has been a hub for uh, surrogacy that a whole industry developed to provide the desired child to people coming for, from uh, the global middle classes and from the West to India who want to have a baby. And new labor relations and new forms of reproductive labor are constructed in these transnational fertility markets. This is, surrogacy is a tailorized and outsourced reproductive contract labor. And at the same time, it is an extractivism of care, bioresources and bodily energy. And, of course, emotional labor, because there is no pregnancy without emotions and affections involved in this. And at the same time, the surrogate mother is told from the very beginning that she has to, ex she has to accept the separation from the child immediately after birth, an extreme form for alienation. It's a precarious, informal labor, no social and health protection. And it is a labor subjugated to the capitalist market, an embodied labor to the capitalist market principle of competition and maximization of efficiency. Just an example is there are surplus pregnancy so that several embryos nest in a woman's uterus. The ordering parents are, are asked, how many do you want? And if they say we want only one baby, the others are aborted without even, very often without telling the surrogate mother. So the discourses in India were that uh, about the commodification of women as a prize vessel and about reproductive assembly line. It makes for a stratified reproduction and neogenics, as Pandu says. And then, as you know, there has been the debates around the ban, no commercialization of Indian women. So my third thesis, and I would like to continue for two or three minutes. My third thesis is the subordination of care work to neoliberal capitalist logic and depletion of care capacities leads to care struggles and resistance against care extractivism. Since more than 10 years, we have in Western Europe new types of labor struggles in the health sector, in the care sector. And it is a kind of feminization of labor struggles, in particular in, particular in these sectors. So, for example, in kindergartens or in, the, in Switzerland, the Polish migrant caregivers for the elderly, these 24 hour jobs, they protested and said, we are not slaves. It's a new politics of visibility, recognition and dignity. And uh, we had in the recent past care struggles in a number of hospitals in Western Europe, here for example in Berlin. And these struggles made a difference in terms of they are not only uh, against the working conditions and against the neoliberal uh, regulations of the health sector and in the hospitals, but what they make very clear is, of course, they want better payment, but they want to deliver quality services. Quality services. And therefore they are saying, 
we more of us are better for everybody. And then trying to build alliances with citizens who are the patients, because it, it is in their interest if more nurses are employed, if more doctors are employed, and they really get quality care. So normalization of care expectivism is about the entanglement of paid and unpaid work, and it aims at the construction of cheap reproductive care labor in the global market. It's an imperial expansion of the capitalist accumulation into non earlier non-market areas and into the body, and the care drain from others. It's a neoliberal strategy leaves a burden to fix all the contradictions between paid and unpaid emotional and rational uh, to the individual care worker as an entrepreneur of the sex. And it leads to depletion of care capitalism cause and causes care struggles and new political subjects. And I am just in the process of writing up a research proposal because I would like to do a comparative study in India. And after listening to Kiran, now this was already, I think, a very, very good example, the scheme work for care extractivism. And, and I would like to explore if the concept of care extractivism is helpful in the Indian context to understand the ongoing reconfiguration of social reproduction. Thank you very much. I just want to thank Professor Upiti Patel for inviting me to be a participant in this conference, today's conference. Thank you so much. Uh, I would have loved, you know, to talk about the challenges I faced during my serious career and, uh, you know, the torture I have seen. Anyway, maybe next time. But uh, State Commission for Women, where I worked for eight years for uplifting of women, there are so many schemes in GMK, like, you know, other states we have gone from India is implementing many schemes for women and we also got the village departments who are working for women like social welfare board, social welfare department, uh, there is a commission, then uh, we have uh, empowerment, uh, this uh, mission for women empowerment where I was uh, mission director also and we have the rehabilitation council, where we look after the women and children who are militancy victims. So I was the executive director for that also. I have experience of you know looking at women's issues from being a director in social welfare, then being a secretary in State Commission for Women and Mission Director Women Empowerment. Uh, the State uh, Commission for Women, you know, it came into existence in JNK during 1999 and started its work in 2000. When the National Commission for Women was established during 1995, basically we wanted that uh, the women of JNK uh, should know about their legal rights their political rights, their social rights, and the empowerment, how they can gain the empowerment. The social state commission for women came into existence. Uh, initially, we didn't have you know much to do because uh, nobody knew what we are going to do in commission. But there was a chairperson, Dr. Uh, Girjadhar, and she did a lot of work. Uh, then was this secretary also. They started awareness programs in different. Uh, you know, places and told the women that we, what we are going to do for them legally, especially legally. And the State Commission for Women, they are having this uh, whole powers, but we cannot punish them. It's the central government also, it's a National Commission for Women also. So that was the you know, great thing, we couldn't punish uh, the people. Though we would put them behind the bars for one day, two days, three days, but not beyond that. Um, when I start working with the commission, it was really a challenge for me to do something for these women. And so many women used to come to us 
first of all, you know, they were very frightened if we go to the commission, what will happen. But uh, simultaneously they came and started uh, try telling their stories. Especially, you know, we are in Turmoy for the last uh, more than 27 years, and the women of that area are facing a lot of problems. Mental problems, legal problems, social problems, and the migration problems. You know, their kids are moving towards, uh, you know, better things for education, for livelihood. They leave the places and go outside the state. And the women of, the, of our areas, different areas, especially in rural areas, uh, went from our, my sister, she came, she talked about you know, how she faced the problems, um, you know, in her area. And uh, so many women, they were being tortured by their husbands, by their, you know, family members not to go out, not to work, not to go for study. And they, then they st uh, started coming to us. There were a lot of problems and we share, they shared, with, they shared uh, the problems with us. What we started, we started surveying the areas. A lot of things have been done. Just I want to, because I have very less time with me. Uh, we did the surveys and we saw that women are suffering. And uh, you know, uh, for so many ailments like backache, when we uh, went there and uh, you know talked to them, why we, we consulted the doctors also why they are having the backaches because they were carrying the wood, they were carrying the water from long distances, you know, to their home. And that was the one problem. And second, they were using, uh, they were going to the forest to cut the trees for their, you know, firewood for making their meals. That was another problem. And uh, uh, what we did, we thought that there should be, a, you know, budgeting, gender budgeting. Uh, we should introduce this, and we introduced that in the state, and uh, we were able to organize 26 gender budgeting workshops. And Ritu Dhiman was, you know, she was uh, part of that in all 26 workshops. And there were so many uh, professionals came from different areas and we organized this with, with the top down. We did with the commissioner secretaries and the district of the panchayat members and Anamadi workers and, you know, and the, uh, the panchayat members also. So that was also, also a, you know, good work because they didn't know how to do, what, how to spend, where to get the money, where to go. And uh, we did some surveys also, Fisher women. You know, we have three religions. We have Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. Uh, and you know, three, uh, Jammu is different, Ladakh is different, Kash uh, Kashmir is different. We have language different, dress different. We have, uh, you know, our eating habits is different. But one thing I just want to tell you about Ladakh. Ladakh is, uh, Ladakh is a hilly area, maybe some people might have gone to Leh and Kargil. And in, in a Leh, women are powerful. They control the economy, you know. They have, uh, they just have the cows, uh, milk, milk cows, they sell the milk, they sell the vegetables, they sit on the shops, and you will see there is no quality in uh, Leh, and it's all controlled by women in Leh. You never see, you know, quality in they sell there. So that's one aspect. Then we have Kashmir, this hodgepodge, uh, you know, it's uh, because of the turmoil and we are facing a lot of problems. Obviously, you see pollution everywhere and uh, schools are closed sometimes and, you know, uh, strikes are there. Now there is Jammu. We have different languages there, but we go six months to Jammu and six months to Kashmir. Administration goes there. And uh, three, three, three divisions so we have different, you know, uh, lifestyles in uh, three areas. But uh, I'm, I'm very glad to uh, tell you that Leh has, you know, we have a really, really women empowerment there, and they control the economy there. Men do, doesn't do that, but women do that, and uh, so we need to learn something from them. Uh, we did some, uh, we conducted some survey, surveys in many, many areas. Then we did some. Uh, workshops with drivers and police people. Drivers, why drivers? Because you know, women go in the uh, public transport and there is a lot of problems with women, girls, girls, girls. So we did two, three workshops with conductors and drivers uh, of the area. Then we did some surveys with fishermen. We have fishermen also in Kashmir. 
they sell the fish and they are the boldest people in our area. These women, fisher women are very bold, they put their you know, fish on their head and go up to the you know, top of the bus and keep their bag there and you know, sell the fish. And we talk to the government that we must have a fish, fish market for them as state commission for women that we must have some area for them. Uh, uh, demarcate some area and government did that but these women never went there. They said no we are not going to go there because we have our own market different places. They go themselves in army camps to sell their fish and they are very happy. They go the CRP camps to sell their fish. They are very happy. They go everywhere. You know every every corner of uh, this, uh, this Kashmir you will see that they are selling the fish. So they are also happy with that. Doing it. But we are going to have you no know, safe places for them to have a market place for these fisher women. Uh, inshallah. Then uh, uh, we wanted to have some, you know, some videos, some workshops in different colleges and schools. And we were going in Baramula, this is one of the districts, and we did one workshop there and we were coming out from uh, there and we saw some girls, you know, they just roaming here and there. I asked them why you are roaming there, we are looking for the toilets uh, in the, you know, uh, in, in the marketplace. It, it was not available. Then we wrote all the commissioners to have the toilets in the marketplace and it was done. And more so to have some seats in uh, the public buses. Um, let me tell you, it, it didn't happen. But recently it happened. We got a very good officer, IDS officer, uh, Basant Rath, he is IG. And he made it mandatory that we must have, you know, at least a man. He said we must have the female seats in the buses and, uh, you know, so now there is mandatory and nobody sits on the uh, on those seats. Uh, thanks to him, uh, he made it possible. You know, even please do some action. Uh, really, you know, they agree. Uh, gender budgeting we did, and we are going to do again. It uh, gender budget is very important. Some sometimes they don't know how to uh, do what to do, and sometimes uh, our government they feel that gender budget is a separate budget for. Uh, women, it's not that, so we need to, you know, teach them also. Uh, but they are not, they are not spending it, you know, the way we should. They are not following the rules. They are not following the norms. How we have to do the budgeting for women, uh, and the officers are not, you know, they are not understanding. More so, we have a lot of problems, uh, political problems, incident, you know, the government rule. It was previously a popular government. So women, at large women are suffering a lot. Women groups are there and I'm working with women groups this time also. They want that we should have, at least peace, peace must be there. And we have an organization called Peace Foundation for uh, President. And we, call, we uh, meet in groups and talk about that. And we do some uh, work also there. You know, while being in commission, I have seen there's a lot of uh, violence uh, uh, you know, has come up uh, because of the turmoil, and the people are, the women are suffering. Sometimes they feel that they are going to be divorced. Um, it's, you know, sometimes uh, it, as per as per the Hindu law, you know, if the other party is not ready to divorce, they cannot do you know all that. But I have seen in commission they do marry separately, but they don't say that we have. You know, I have married some other ladies. So that's again one problem in general region. Uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some, some uh, health issues. Uh, which I just want to highlight here. We have some health issues, um, mental, uh, mental health issues with women. It's because of the rule. And I request to you, even women, many a times that we must have some counselors so that they can visit this area and talk to them and send some counselors. Uh, at least to, you know, to see the women, women of that area. Uh, I just want to give an example, there is no time, but I just want to give an example. <coughs> once a man, he, once a woman, she came and she lodged a complaint with the commission that my husband says all the time that he is going to divorce her. Uh, we, we summoned that, her husband and he came. I asked him why you are uh, all the time, you know, uh, threatening her to uh, divorce her. She said, you know, if she was working, but she has got some problem in her leg. She cannot work now in the field. Uh, and I need some worker, I need some, you know, woman who will work in the field. So I'm divorcing and I'm getting some, you know, another woman. Disgusting. So we put her in uh, custody for two days. 
but even then, you know, see, women, they are ta being taken as uh, the workers at home and outside. Even we, what are we? We are also, somebody was saying, we are also the, you know, uh, no pay, no pay, uh, unpaid workers at home also. And we have no choice but to rear and care children and the elders and other people. Um, Uh, I have seen, I have read also, seen also that in America uh, on 10th of April they have a day when they, when they, all the women assemble there and they say that we have, we must have equal wages. We have the 8th March, so international day, but we don't talk about the, you know, this um, equal wages. Now, I talk some of the people, some of the women, because we are getting now two years um, two years maternity leave benefits and some women are not happy with that. Uh, I said, why? Well, they said, we are going to lose the uh, benefits. Uh, we are going to lose what they are learned, what they will learn, you know, in these two years. So we don't want the long leave. Some, some women, but some women are really, very really happy uh, with that. And domestic violence, it is increasing day by day in, uh, in our state. And I am really concerned about that, how to help people, how to help these women to come out. We have, many, we have uh, like in the mission, um, empowerment mission, we have safety places for women. We have one, uh, one center, one, one center, one stop center for women, but it's not being implemented, you know. They have funds also, but it's a problem for us. Um, maybe it's a problem with so many states also, it's a government program, government programs are always, you know, Rules and we need to, you know, see into it. And uh, domestic workers, I wanted to talk about that also yesterday. I talked about that, but we need to have the a union for these all women who are suffering from domestic violence as well as domestic workers. I don't have time much to do, but any question, you can answer that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. So just a brief introduction for that. Uh, today, um, it's not easy speaking, being the last speaker at the end of a very intense two-day workshop or conference and then trying to still uh, retain attention of the audience, which, uh, you know, quite surprising that uh, quite a few of you are still uh, eager to listen or at least here present. My topic that was given to me today is on social security. I think for a conference on work and, uh, you know, paid and unpaid work, this is of utmost importance, so it comes at the fag end of the conference. I think it's an issue that has been uh, much more important now as the world is currently in a turmoil with so much of uh, uh, social unrest, so much of uh, churning that is happening because of uh, various financial factors, employment being uh, plummeting in both in developed and developing countries and no longer is this an issue of only the developing countries where we are talking of social security, it seems to be affecting the developed countries as well. So it's a tremendously important uh, issue that we are looking at. And in the brief uh, time that I have with, at my disposal, I thought I would just look at why is it that social security is something that is an unfulfilled agenda even to this day, despite having been uh, set out but since the interwar years or since 1950s, we have been talking about social security, social protection, social protection flows, and all types of terminology that has come into being. And yet, we seem to have very little clarity on what it means. I would like to go to one part, the fundamental issue, I think is the uh, dis disjunct or mismatch between vision and provision. Vision for social security has always been lofty. It has been something which is, you know, very high uh, ideals that have been set forth right from the Beverage Committee report that was there in 1942, a, a landmark report that uh, visualized uh, social security very broadly as freedom from want. This is as broad as you can get and as big a scope that you can think of. But when it gets translated, it gets translated in such truncated ways and the main culprit, I call it a congenital defect that entered into the definition and the interpretation of social security came right in the beginning in 
the 19 uh, Convention 102, adopted in 1958 by ILO and with all the countries, ratified by the countries, where it got truncated into social security provision for organized sector workers for very contingency related measures, whether it's employment, sickness, health and so on. So very limited contingency related measures came to be interpreted as social security provisioning and therefore by definition since most of the women are in the informal sector or unorganized sector, automatically their coverage got completely left out even in developed countries and much more so in developing countries. Now when you look at this uh, definition, was there any attempt to remedy this? Not much really, till the 1989 when you come to Dress and Sen, who articulated and argued that the definition of social security that is there prevalent for the developed countries, which is actually looking at perhaps you know, mostly organized workers, is not really relevant for countries where poverty is pervasive, informality is the norm, and where, you know, the conditions, it is not deprivation, is not something that is residual, but it is endemic. So in countries where poverty is endemic, where deprivation is acute, the question of unemployment benefits doesn't make much sense when everyone seems to be underemployed or uh, employment is of very poor quality. Sickness benefits and stuff like that are applicable only a very, very small, minuscule proportion of the uh, population of organized workers and therefore it is not very relevant at all. And then they started to at least plead it for a widening of the definition to be seen as an objective pursued through public means to include promotional measures like, you know, poverty alleviation, employment generation, education, health and so on. That debate goes on promotional, protective and so on, but nonetheless, this is the widening that happened much later. In 1990, the human development approach once again started looking at universal provision of education, health and such other measures for the people. So the question of what is the role of the state, because that's the topic that I'm supposed to speak about, depends and is intrinsically linked to the way in which you define social security. If you are looking at social security as something which is contingency related benefits in the event of some you know, contingency, there is a payment that is made out, well and good, but that refers only to those who are recognized as workers and I am sure that over these two days and particularly in the last section, we saw that so much of work is not even recognized as work. People who work are not recognized as workers and the question of social protection or social security for such workers is non-existent. So this will form the bulk of the workers in quotes that we are talking about. The era of the 1990s and 2000s was not very different because the onset of globalization, the reduction in the importance of organized sector workers, the contract workers phenomenon that we have talked about, not to, uh, not to mention that invading and pervading even the government uh, schemes. We just heard about the scheme workers, a large number of them. Informalization of contracts even within the formal sector. So all this took a huge toll on the benefits that workers would expect from their employers completely. Moreover, instead of provisioning from the state or from the employers, you found that more of contributory schemes came into being, whether it be pensions, whether it be any other contributions that were there. The MDGs of which much is made out that uh, were introduced in the 2000s also did not give too much importance to social security. Now we come to the more recent times of the SDGs. The sustainable development goals, everyone will agree that they are much more, uh, came out after much deliberation, there is much more consensus from from nation states as well as civil society organizations are supposed to be better formulated than ever before. Now the social security provisions are contained in SDG 1.3 implement nationally appropriate social protection systems for all including flaws for reducing and preventing poverty. One thing about the SDG is it is interlinked and linked with many other goals so it's much more integrated in nature you'll find it is linked to the universal health coverage, SDG 3.8, gender equality, decent work and economic growth and greater equality. 
is also articulate social security as a human right and commitment to universalism rather than you know very targeted benefits that are to be provided. Yet, despite all this, the congenital defect that I talked about earlier continues. So what does it define? After all these lofty aims, human rights and so on that has been articulated, what do we get? The listing of the benefits, children and families, benefits for children and families, maternity benefits, women benefits for women continue to be viewed as maternity benefits, unemployment and employment injury, sickness benefits, old age benefits, disability benefits, survivors benefits and health protection. This is exactly the convention 102 of ILO that was passed in 1958. So 50, 60 years later, we come back to a more integrated vision so-called in the sustainable development goals and yet the biases that had crept in in the initial stage and there is a story as to why the biases had crept in which I'll take a minute to relate and I think at the end of the day it's good to listen to a story. Why is it that the ILO came up with this definition? Very practical, a simple thing. Like all international organizations, and I can speak with some familiarity because I worked in one for 13 years. You wake up late and you want your things done yesterday. And I have been accused of chasing people and some of my friends are here, they will uh, testify as to what a big bully I was to get work done from them under impossible deadlines. What did ILO do? It wanted to have some costs of provision of social security from countries. As is the norm, the questionnaire was circulated to countries. They were supposed to fill in the details of what they considered as social security expenditure. And here lies the trick. They said the cost of social security should include only systems set up by legislation and administered by public, semi-public or autonomous bodies. Once you define the cost of social security and provision in this manner, all that you got were the government schemes and organized sector schemes that were included. It was this uh, factor that determined the definition of Convention 102, which is the standard definition of social security to this day. So you find that the way in which you collect data, the way in which you define your problem, can have serious implications for the lives of people, not only for your research question, but for the lives of people. So SDG, despite all the tall promises, so the difference between the vision and the provision continues to this day. The coverage of benefits, even of these truncated benefits, what is the coverage? I mean, it's okay, it's all organized sector. Globally, you find only 35% of children are covered under this. 41% of mothers receive maternity benefits. Only 22% of unemployed workers are covered. Only 28% persons uh, percent of persons with disability receive disability benefit. The situation obviously is a global picture. Obviously in developing countries the situation is much worse. So in effect there is no so social protection worth the name anywhere in the world except in the very developed countries with completely organized sector workers and where the workers are much more organized and uh, demand social security as their right. This is the scenario and it can get worse because nowhere has social security been perceived as something which enables the basic capabilities of people. It does not look at the vulnerability of the workers and how to enhance their capabilities to have better work conditions or better work itself. There are structural traps that they are entrenched. We won't go into the debate of you know, poverty that is intergenerational that which is durable, you know, inequalities as Naila Kabir talks about. But nonetheless, the rights and entitlements that people are expected to claim, the capability to acquire education and health, the access, all these are unavailable. And therefore, it is not possible for these people to get anywhere near the provision of social security. However, the state is the only institution that can provide such social security to the people. Well, you know, it is not possible for employers alone to fulfill the mandate because not all employers, we have just saw cases where employers are not sensitized, 
or where they are not organized. But the state cannot really function alone. It would need the community level initiatives because that is where insights from the ground can be incorporated and it will need the commitment of even the corporate sector. There is no reason why the corporate sector can only, as we saw in the case of Anganwadi workers, take over Anganwadi. They can transform them. They can see that social security is provided to the entire value chain through which their products are produced and not necessarily be confined to the workers in their factories or in their entities alone. So it requires a change in the mindset. If you are talking of social security for workers, it requires a change in the mindset. Now, several uh, you know, governments right now, either by, due to compulsion or due to uh, their change in the orientation or, or because of political compulsions, because you will find social unrest rising in several countries, Many countries due to electoral politics are talking about providing social security to the unorganized sector. India is no exception. We have some unorganized sector social security act, the RSBY and so on schemes which are supposed to provide health uh, benefits to the people. Now, if this is to be done, then obviously you would require some sort of partnership. Now, one, a third point that I want to make is that Whenever things fail, it is women who come to the rescue. In social security, it is no different. You will find that things are not working, bring women in because they will try and do things better. In the conditional cash transfer schemes that have been implemented across the globe, you will find that women are kept in the lead so that they are in a position to ensure the delivery of the scheme. Civil society programs also, you will find, since state can't provide social security, anything to do with women, Women, please organize yourselves, provide social security to yourselves. Do self-help groups if you want credit, get health insurance if you want, you know, healthy, health benefits. Seva is one example where successfully managed to provide health insurance. BRAC in Bangladesh is also an example where remarkable success, where they have a more integrated approach of provision of social security as well as empowering the people. So women's empowerment in agency is something which the civil society initiatives have demonstrated worldwide. Some governments, if the government is sensitive, they do design schemes. You will find Southeast Asian countries have adopted schemes for social security to women migrant workers. Thailand also has similar schemes. In Tamil Nadu, I, I urge all of you to take a look at that scheme, a transgender welfare board where social security provisions and protection is uh, for the needs of the transgender people are being provided. So if the government is sensitive, the government has a will, there is a way. Kerala, of course, is well known for the welfare boards. Moving forward, you'll find that a huge backlog of deprivation, increasing vulnerability, and the poverty that still continues to be there, even in middle-income countries. Employment situation is volatile. Social security cannot be confined to contingency-related measures. It has to encompass a capability enhancement and empowerment and state and global governance institutions also need to play a role because the global funds can contribute to social security and global policies can enhance and augment the definition of social security and implementation will require the collaboration with various stakeholders including the CSOs and the corporate sector. Thank you. Caretakers, 24 hours caretakers are in private households and they are living there and very often they are alone with the elderly person. Very often they are alone with the elderly person in a household. Or somebody else is in the household but employed and out of the house the full day and doesn't have the time to care for the father, for the mother, or whoever. So the interaction takes place only between the elderly person who is within the household and the caregiver. And the caregiver, and sometimes other family members. Yeah, this is the interaction which takes place. And the other family members who employ, for example, the caretaker, are interested in a cheap labor force because they have to pay from their own income uh, 
the caretaker. So is it leading towards any transformation the, at the broader level, at the contextual level? Which transformation do you mean? Tra social transformation. Because there are people of different uh, color yes. and culture yes. interacting. Yes. So is that affecting the social relations? You see, we have, we have many discourses wheeling these relationships. One discourse in the long time is, for example, elderly people in the Global South, or, for example, in the East, in Poland as well, they, uh, they are very much respected. So taking care uh, of elderly people for, in other cult cultures, is something very emotional and loving. And so it is expected from these people that they do some professional work, some professional caretaking, and at the same time being very loving. So it's, it's the same kind of dependency you explored related to the homemakers. The homemaker is, feels herself very much dependent from the domestic work. And the family members uh, feel very much dependent, and they are very much dependent, of the 24-hour living-in caretaker. So there are affinities, yes, you are right, but still, they are the others. Yeah? Coming from another culture, coming uh, from a country where in, in the economy, this cheap labor is abundantly available. It's a surplus of cheap labor for us in a more wealthy country. So this kind of uh, stereotypes are not broken up, but uh, still there are new forms of affinity, yes. Thank you once again to the whole panel. Uh, Hakisam, and this is regarding uh, the whole concept of half widow, which we hear so much about, and one of my colleague friends did some extensive research on that. I want to know from you what are the experiences or like, okay, any changes. Secondly, the youth, young women, like, okay, very aspirant young women from all of this, Jammu, Kashmir, and that. Uh, has there been any change saying that enough is enough? Ame azadi se koi bhaklabe, ame wale kariyar se bhaklabe. Future care. Do you find there is any change with respect to that? And uh, my own professor Sita Man, like uh, the whole government's perception of like uh, withdrawing from the social security or making it lesser in budgets, uh, like maybe the seventh pay commission, you don't see. Uh, they said the uh, revision of pension will be taken up later, like not now. So, what are your comments or observations? My history going on for the last 20, more than 27 years, some uh, you know men went missing and they are still missing. And as per Sharia, which is a law, Islamic law, after four years, you know you have to wait for up to four years, and if the husband doesn't come back, then you can move for another marriage. But uh, you know uh, during these four years, we call them half widows because the husband is not visible, he's not coming home, so we call them half widows. And uh, now, so many women have remarried now because the husband didn't come back. And regarding this, uh, we don't need Azadi, and we just want it's a political issue, and uh, we don't want to comment on that. But uh, women at large, they just want peace. You know. I think the governments are going to withdraw more and more from their, you know, obligations yeah. and leave it more and more to the people to organize their own social security. So they're encouraging you to contribute to pension schemes, national pension schemes and others. And your uh, old age, your health and your uh, children's education, etc. will be your responsibility. The state is no longer in that uh, space where it wants to do. That's why I said that if there, it has a will, they will find ways to do it. If there is no will, then obviously there is nothing else that can be said about it. 
they will always find excuses in terms of efficiency, in terms of uh, delivery, in terms of implementation. They will not think that the public sector services should be improved. But they will say these are not functioning, so we will give you a better one which is private for which you pay. So this is the trend and I think we just now we realize the better it is. Thanks to the three panelists uh, for bringing in three different perspectives of the three different areas of women in the workforce and the state. Uh, Professor Krista Victorik uh, talked about how the state responds to the declining uh, population in Germany and the increasing need for care in the context of uh, the growing elderly population and the need for reproduction was by importing women from the uh, south or from other parts uh, of the world which were economically uh, less developed. And as a consequence is what she talked about, the care extra activism, the phrase that she uh, has created, I would say, in order to uh, describe this process. Uh, and what we saw again is that completely ignoring the specific needs of this new category of uh, care workers that are coming from a different part of the world and the impact of this on their own uh, families and communities back in their uh, countries. Uh, so what you saw is that there really isn't uh, much of a response or much of a provision uh, made with reference to these uh, women uh, and a new form of an exploitation that is happening. And uh, again, the interesting thing, the kind of new stereotype that is created, right? Like as if in our societies, there is much more sympathy and care for the elderly that, uh, you know, isn't there. So we're just creating another myth that the West creates. And then, of course, the practical realities, as I just reading today's newspaper, talks about the Maharashtra government having to, uh, you know, shame uh, people who are not taking care of their own parents. So this is the reality of India today. But the... Uh, myth that is created in the West like other Orientalist uh, myths is that these are communities that care and respect and love their elderly and therefore they will take care of our elderly when we don't have the time or the inclination to take care of our own. The second presentation by Ms. Uh, Afisa Muzaffar was a completely different one in terms of she's looking at her role uh, as part of the state and its response uh, trying to uh, build capacities uh, trying to enable women and at the same time, uh, as we all know, state commissions for women and their limitations in being able to actually deliver women from the violence that they experience in their lives or to, uh, as she said, despite numerous workshops on gender budgeting, that the offices are reluctant to use that experience and that knowledge in their work. Uh, the third presentation by Professor Sita Prabhu and apologize for not introducing you uh, was about again another kind of state response right social security and uh, the last remark that you made madam I think clearly reflects the fact that we are living in a neoliberal state market uh, economy consumerism and capitalism at its height which obviously means total state withdrawal from anything that will benefit uh, the community and to expect that the corporates are going to do that when they do not see profit uh, is really asking for too much and I think I just leave with some of the uh, you know I would say uh, quotations that you gave uh, as you were speaking and one of them is uh, the social security promise which was made uh, with our constitution and afterwards is still just you know, you know a failed uh, vision uh, despite a lofty uh, vision, the difference between vision and provision and the fact that I think most importantly given the context of the two days conference is a complete ignorance and lack of sensitivity to the realities of women's lives and women's work. Because whatever social security measures are being discussed or talked about, it completely ignores the fact that 94% of the women in the workforce are in the informal sector and therefore completely outside the purview of anything the government may even just talk about. Uh, thank you very much and thank you Professor Vibhuti for having me here and uh, thank you all to all the speakers and participants. I enjoyed listening to the presentations and reading the abstracts in the, uh, uh, I mean the book that you have created. Thank you so much.